partnership with JEA and um, local libraries to be able to offer these home energy and water evaluation backpacks for you, or as I like to call them, the backpacks. Um, quick little housekeeping note, um, the backpacks are available to check out with a valid um, Duval County Public Library card. Um, if you check it out, whichever branch where you check it out, you do need to return it there. So if this isn't your home branch, um, you're more than welcome to check it out in a branch that's a little bit closer to home, um, and that way you don't have to make a big drive to return it. Um, so I want to say a big thanks to Agape Interpreting Services. Ruthie is here with us um, doing interpreting, and in case anyone um, needs interpreting services in the future, um, she just has some cards in the back. And so we are so excited to have them so um, really quickly, we're going to go around the room and everyone just say their name and why they're here, what they're interested in learning, so that way we can make sure um, that we um, touch the topic that you guys are most interested in. So we're going to start over here with you, ma'am. Okay, oh, yes, good morning. Um, my name is Patty Sanford, and um, recently um, bought a house and um, just the sprinkler system, you know, just kind of how the water works, just kind of what's normal for me. Okay. You know, so I just need to find out what's normal for everything's working right. Okay, perfect, perfect. Glad to hear you. Sherry Bell, and I would like to learn how to save more energy and be able to um, learn how to buy a proper house in the future. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to close this door. Please let me know if it gets a little bit too warm in here. Um, I don't have control of the thermostat, which you guys all should have control over your home, but we um, can pop back open if it gets a little too squishy. So please let me know. Great. So, um, just a quick show of hands who has JEA for? Water or electricity or both. Okay. Well, just so you know, you don't have to have JEA to be able to check out a backpack. But then you guys are fully well aware of. Bring it to clear the one. <laughs> so you guys are fully well aware of JEA and know well about them. But an interesting fact about JEA. There we go. Is that um, they have 4,200 um, miles of pipeline. So there's a lot of infrastructure. 
pressure to get that water to your faucet so that when you go to lift it up, the water comes out. So, so there's a lot of behind the scenes. So as I said, I'm with the Green Team Project, which is a local um, environmental nonprofit, and we're dedicated to basically helping people make um, sustainable habits in their everyday household chores and living, um, and to help people equip them so they have those tools and to learn about what's more sustainable than others. And so there's a lot of what we call greenwashing out there. It's like, well, they say it's green, but is it really? So it kind of helps give you some facts to be able to tell. Um, and aside from the backpacks, we also have um, a free environmental curriculum for students in grades 3 through 12 um, that you can access on our website. And then also, our other program is basically if you get interested in doing the backpack and you want to learn more, we also have this green action guide for local actions that you can take here in Jacksonville. And has anyone heard of One Spark? Yes. Okay, I see some head shaking. Well, One Spark is this great um, annual event that just happened for the first time last year, and it happens in downtown. And basically, it gives people who have ideas and musicians who are starting up this platform to be able to reach a whole lot of people um, in the community and potential investors to share their idea, idea and spread it with the community and hopefully maybe get some funding or at least get some votes. Um, and the votes then help get part of like a public funding Kickstarter campaign. So we are going to be at One Spark for our local green action guide. We're turning it from paper to electronic, so that way we are fully in the 21st century and not using paper. So definitely please come check us out. Check out One Spark. It's going to be a fun, fun event. Um, it's free to attend. And you can cast your vote for projects that you like. So moving right along, today we're going to talk about energy and water, why it's important to conserve both, use it wisely, and then what you can do to do that. So we'll go ahead and get started. So why is it important to use energy wisely? This visual basically depicts um, the energy consumption in 2009 in the US. Dark yellow um, are states that use more energy, and dark blue are states that use less energy. So Wyoming came in first, being the most energy um, hungry, with 950 million BTUs, British thermal units. Um, and then Florida, we came in with 212 million BTUs, or 232, excuse me, million BTUs per person. The average for the country was 302, but you definitely have your Wyoming sort of helping kind of skew that average. Um, but so we're doing okay, but still, that's a lot of energy per person um, to use. So let's kind of put that in context. That's a big number. What does that really mean? So one BTU is a match. So if you were to go to strike a match, that's one British thermal unit. If you go get a 16-ounce soda, that's 770 British thermal units. And it just keeps moving on up. Um, so we talk about like, barrels of oil. Um, these barrels hold 55 US gallons. They're about three feet high, so kind of about like my waist level. And they have 5.8 million BTUs. That's a lot of match. Um, and based off of our consumption in 2009, we basically used 40 barrels of oil per Floridian. So that's each individual, not just as a state, individual. So again, when you think about it in matchsticks, or even sodas, that's a lot of energy. Um, and then also in 2008, the U.S. got the award for the most energy-hungry country. Um, we have less than 5% of the world's population but we use 25% of the world's energy supply. So to kind of put that in context, um, China used 15% of the world's energy supply, but they have 20% of the world's population. And they're still um, considered a developing country, but just to put that in context, we use almost a quarter of the world's energy supply, and we have less than 5% of the world's population. So we're energy hungry. We like our energy. Um, but basically, you know, we use energy all day, like, we woke up and we turned on the lights. Um, so we need it in many different forms, and it comes from different resources. Um, here in Jacksonville, JEA uses coal, um, natural gas, and then also um, some solar. We have a solar farm over in Baldwin. Um, but what they use basically is dependent on the market price. So if natural gas is more expensive um, that day or that week, they'll use coal or oil. Um, and basically, these 
whichever resource we use, it does leave an impact on the environment, just in the um, obtaining it and then how we use it. Um, so as our population grows and as our energy demand grows, it's just going to leave more and more impact on the environment. And prices are then going to continue to increase. So what does this mean? What can we do? Basically, the best thing that you can do for your wallet and for the environment is to basically know how you're using your energy and why. So you kind of got to drill down into your bill and find out well, where's all this energy really going. So we're going to do just that. And we provided you the tools to do that. The Home Energy and Water Evaluation Backpack Kit. Um, you can check it out with a library card. And it gives you all the tools and instructions to be able to do your own home energy and water audit. You don't have to be a handyman. You don't have to know, you know much about home repair or anything like that. Basically, just know your right from your left and be able to use a ruler and you are golden. We'll walk you through the rest of the way. So we're basically going to walk through kind of like how you do your audit, share some facts and tips and help you in that process. Okay, so talking about drilling down and finding out how you're using your energy and what it's composed of, we're going to talk about finding your base load and your rate. And this graphic here is interesting because it's basically representative of a home in Northeast Florida. And as you can see, heating, cooling, and then heating water um, compose almost two thirds of your energy bill. So we're gonna see if help you find out if that's the case in your home and what you can do about that. So first you have to find the information. Um, so you can just go to JEA.com. Um, and log in. If you haven't ever logged in, they'll walk you through creating a username. If you're like me and forget your password two days after you created it, um, they'll help you with that as well. So you log in and then you're going to go and click on this blue bar, track my usage, lower my bill. And there we go. Um, then you're going to click on bill history. And then you can select between um, energy or electric. And we're going to start with electric. But this is also where you're going to go to find out about your water usage. And then you can see basically like a year's um, worth of information, a little bit more. And you'll be able to see kind of the fluctuation in your energy bill. So this red line here at the bottom, that represents your base load and function. And that is basically the energy that it takes to run your house. Kind of whether you're there or not, it's kind of that Regardless of the weather, this is how much energy you consume in your home. But then you can see that we have that top line, and the energy that's used between those two lines represents the energy that you use to heat and cool. And you can see how much fluctuation there is. It can almost double your energy bill depending on how the weather is. So a lot of things are weather dependent, and especially this winter when we've had hot and cold, really cold and then 80 degrees, you know, your poor HVAC system is definitely trying to work to keep it up. Um, and so it's something to be mindful of. Um, a quick tip, when you are heating, when it's really cold, like yesterday, I was frozen almost all the time, um, you want to make sure that when you change the temperature, you do so in small increments. So that way you avoid having your heat strips come on, which are a very expensive way to heat. And basically the heat strips are indicated by having the auxiliary or emergency heat. Um, that can be almost twice um, as costly to heat using those. So you want to make sure you change your thermostat in a few degree increments. So to start calculating, we have these workshop worksheets in the backpack where you can basically record your uh, energy usage for the year and then be able to start calculating what your rate is. So if you're like me and you like shortcuts and making it easy, you can also go to jea.com forward slash backpack. And there we have basically a PDF where you can enter the values in and they'll do the math for you. So that's another option as well at jea.com forward slash backpack. So you want to find out what your rate is. How much are they really charging you? So you can see your consumption and then your charges. You divide your charges by your consumption to get the cents per kilowatt hour that you're being charged. So the typical rate for JEA is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. So 13 cents, okay, you know, you can't really buy anything with 13 cents, but how does that really kind of add up? So if you were to run two light bulbs, if you were to run a compact fluorescent light bulb, so a spiraling one, um, like I have on the display over there, um, a 14 watt one, which is equal to a 60 watt incandescent light bulb, if you run both of those for four hours, 
every day for a year, the charge of 13 cents per kilowatt hour would be $11.50 for the incandescent, but $2.76 for the compact form. And these are just two light bulbs for four hours in the house. So you know, you have like 80 light bulbs in your house. So it adds up. So your building envelope. Does anyone know what the building envelope is? Well, the insulation is going to be a part of that. Yeah. So the building envelope is basically kind of like the structural components of your house. So like your walls, your floor, your attic, your roof. And that's basically what constructs your building. So as part of the building envelope, in the industry we say you want a tight building envelope. So you want to make sure there's no leaks and a lot of air leaks. Um, and part of that is your thermal boundaries, so your insulation is key there for that. Um, and then also, in part of a tight uh, boundary, you want to make sure that there aren't air leaks, which we call infiltration. So basically, air coming through. Um, and that makes your HVAC system have to work harder because you have this unconditioned air coming in, and you're trying to keep this nice, you know, like 65, 70 degree um, temperature in your home. So as part of energy audit, um, professionals come in with a huge, big in thermal, um, thermal camera, or a thermal imaging camera, where they can basically see the temperature differences. And in this top right corner picture, you can see that this is a cool day, so they're trying to heat. But then you see these dark blue spots. That's representing a temperature difference. So that's a lot of cool air leaking through into your room. You're trying to keep it comfortable and warm. So that would be an indication that you probably need to go up into your attic and check your insulation. And then here in this picture, they're cooling. Um, you have about 70 degrees coming in, and the ambient temperature is about 78. But then there's a spot over here where it's up in the high 80s. So that would be another indication that there's some warm air coming in. And so you want to take a look at that, because that's just basically, you know, you're spending extra money to try to keep your room comfortable when here's this big kind of gaping hole, if you will. So infiltration. So this diagram over here represents all these spots where the air can come in. And for professional home energy auditors, they can get this blower door test. So basically, they're trying to depressurize your home so that the outside air wants to come in and the inside air is going out. So that way you can see where all your infiltration is. So being a do-it-yourself kind of backpack kit, we gave you instructions on how to do that. So the way you can do it is basically turn off all your gas combustion appliances. So like make sure you turn off your water heater, um, and then basically turn on all your exhaust fans and walk around with a candle or incense stick and see where your flame gets to kind of quiver. So if it's around the windows, around your door, you can definitely see, okay, well, maybe I need to put some leather stripping here. Maybe I need to clock some here. Um, I did it on one of the nights when it was really cold out in the beginning of the winter, and I realized that I had a huge gap basically where my door, front door meets um, the door frame. And that was some cold air coming in. So my solution for the one night was basically put a blanket up against it. Um, but then I definitely need to put some other stripping there as well. So it's a great way to be able to find out where those areas are. And insulation. Insulation is key, and insulation is all about insulation. Um, you can have great insulation, but if it's not put in there correctly, it's, you know, you're not getting your biggest bang for your buck. Um, so we got really creative in the building industry. Um, and when it comes to insulation, the way it's kind of rated is an R value. The R stands for resistance, resistance to air flow. Um, and so in Florida, based on where we live, the recommended R value for your attic is an R49. Um, and the way that they figure out what your R, your effective R value is, is that depending on the type of insulation you have, there's an R value per inch, and then you multiply that by the depth. So that's why we give you a ruler um, and a lot of basically say, you know, go up safely into your attic and determine the type of insulation that you have, and then also measure the depth. So that way you can find out what your effective um, total R value is. And again, the recommended is R49. That's not what the building code standard is. It's much lower. Um, but this is a great way to be able to kind of get a big bang for your buck and not have to constantly check something. You put it in there, you'll be it. Um, so these are some examples right up here of that's poor insulation. So this is um, fiberglass back insulation. This has a higher effective R value 
Um, it's around like three to four. But obviously it's not in good repair, it's not in good shape, and it's not laid out consistently. You want it to be more laid out like this. This is your Pink Panther um, loose fill fiberglass. And this stuff is, it's cheaper, um, but it also, also has a lower effective R value per inch. It's more about the two. So you just think, okay, so if it's two, um, the value of two per inch, and you're trying to get a 49. So that means you have, need a lot of insulation. So you want to make sure that it's laid out evenly. So up here in the top right, they have that fiberglass bat, which is good. It has a high effect of R value, but it's also compressed, and it looks like the installers weren't quite sure what to do around that ductwork. So you want to make sure that it's not compressed because, again, that's preventing it from doing some maximum insulating. So um, if you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to figure out what kind of insulation I have in my attic unless it's this, you know, cool pink panther. Um, in this great consumer reports book in the um, backpack, so this is the type of insulation and some of the effective values, as well as in um, this evaluation guide as well. So we'll help you along. So your HVAC components, sorry, this thing just wants to skip her. Um, so does anyone know what HVAC stands for? Yes. Yes, ding, ding, ding. So heating, um, ventilation, and air conditioning system. And this is what helps keep your home cool or hot um, if it's cold outside. So here in Jacksonville, the most common type of, type of air vac system is um, an air source heat pump. So basically, um, it has two out indoor and outdoor components, so it's a split system. And it actually is a, a pretty efficient system. Um, it works well for our area because it does need to have um, pretty constant temperatures between 40 and 90 degrees. I'm hoping we're you know, not so close to the 40 degrees, but it works well for our area. And basically, there's four components to it. You have the compressor, which is outside. You have the air ducts. You have the air handler, which is your inside component. And then also you have the refrigerant. So without getting into the nitty gritty, basically um, your refrigerant can basically evaporate. Uh, it has a low um, boiling pressure temperature, and so it can evaporate by, and then removes the heat from your home, and then condenses in the outside, and then begins to circle. So it's basically you have this um, liquid that can remove your heat from your home, and it evaporates and um, condenses back into a liquid. So it's changing state a lot. And so that can mean that um, your refrigerant charge, which is basically just like the level of the refrigerant in your system, it can easily kind of sink below that recommended value. So we do recommend that you have a professional come out and check your HVAC system annually, just make sure it's in good repair. And they'll also check to make sure that you have appropriate refrigerant level. So also ways to keep your HVAC system in good repair, the distribution system, um, your ductwork. You want to make sure that there's no, basically, anything um, blocking the airflow and that you don't have any sharp turns. Um, so if you have a 90 degree angle, that's a lot of work that has to go through to keep moving that air through it. You want nice and kind of um, fluid and curved turns. So we'll talk more about that. Um, and then also compressors, that's your outdoor system. You want to make sure that it's a pretty good distance away from your home so that at least there can be some good airflow around all four sides of it. And you want to make sure that there aren't any other plants or trees over top of it so that debris getting, gets inside. And you also want to make sure that like your grass isn't kind of creeping up around it as well. So the thermostat. Um, let me quick break. Um, if you do have any questions throughout as I'm moving along, please feel free to ask. Yes? Um, one of the things you're talking about is insulation. Yeah. And that's installed at the time the house is built. Is there any recommended time that a person should have it replaced? You know, I don't know if it wears out or anything. Yeah, yeah. So um, you also, like, parts of things to check would be, like, you know, has it gotten moist or damp um, or damaged? Like, is it constricted, so pressed down? Um, so you basically want to make sure that it's in pretty good repair. I would say maybe a house that's, like, 20 years old, it'd be good to go check and see, A, what kind of insulation you have. If it's this pink panther, you can probably add to it, especially after, I'd say, you know, five to ten years, start looking at it to make sure that it's not beginning to wear down um, and so that you maintain that depth. And um, so let's say you go in and you realize you have that pink panther and so you want to add insulation. Um, 
as an effective R value per inch increases, it does get more expensive, so you want to kind of take a look at your budget. But you can, so let's say this is your ad, you can go in and add back over top of it. They recommend that you do it basically perpendicular to it, um, so that way you're not compressing the um, insulation that's already there. And you also want to make sure that it wouldn't have like this space on it. You see that kind of like cardboard? So that way there isn't a moisture um, sealant, so that way moisture can kind of go through um, that may be coming up through that. So is there a time span particularly? Um, I would say like five to 10 years. Um, I would check about five years, make sure you know it hasn't gotten moist, there's not a leak coming through or anything like that. Um, because it is one of those kind of passive ways to save energy. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Um, okay, so um, what else? What, how can I make it a little bit clearer? I mean, I just kind of wonder if you have a house that's just built, mm -hmm. your installation, if they did it properly, is pretty good. Yeah. If you continue to stay in that house 20 years, I'm just kind of wondering, I can understand about maybe you have to re replace the, um, the roof, you know, get it reshingled and everything, but if you don't really have any leaks, does that mean that that doesn't uh, uh, like, rot, dry rot, or anything yeah. like that? So I would say if you're getting your roof repaired, so you, you know, you bought a new house and it's time to get your roof repaired or reshingled, Take a look at your insulation just to make sure, like it can last for a long time. Um, you just want to make sure that, yeah, that it hasn't gotten moist, that it's not compressed, um, and that you know maybe you can get more energy savings by adding to it or replacing it depending on the type that you have. So if they put good quality in there, it should last quite a while. So the thermostat, um, set it and check it. So the recommended values for your thermostat in the summer, 78 degrees, and then 68 degrees in the winter. Um, so 78 degrees Fahrenheit in Florida, are you kidding me? Do you want us to like all dehydrate um, and be like not get on the JDA store being like, I'm about to die here. Um, so it is all about, you know, if you do that insulation, you have a good um, building envelope. It makes it more doable. It really does. And also then, you know, it's all about using your ceiling fans and whatnot. And you know, if you need to make it cooler, make it cooler. But just know that it does add up if you pay a little bit more. So also being smart about it. If you're out of the house during the day, say that that's 78. No need to keep it nice and cool for your plants. Um, so just some things about smart setting. So HVAC in, um, system inspection. So you want to see how well is your HVAC system working. So that way you can find out do I have anything issues that I need to address. So, in our backpack kit, we have this cool infrared thermometer. So, aside from the fun that you might have of kind of like annoying your cat with this red laser, you can also use it to basically identify um, the temperature differences in your supply and your return. So, let's see, it's kind of warm in here, so let's see what the temperature is. Woo! It is warm in here, isn't it? I'm getting like 82 out of there. So then I'm going to check my return. I'm getting 77. So you want about a 14 to 22 degree difference between um, your supply and your return. Um, if it's more or less, that can be indicative of maybe some leaky ductwork um, or some, something kind of blocking that airflow. Um, is that in the it is, it is. A lot of what I'm covering is in the packet. Um, and if you want a little bit more information, we have this, and then we also do have one gauge that you can walk around um, your house with as you're going about doing your audit. So a lot of this information is in the backpack. Um, and so this is a great way to be able to find out how efficiently your HVAC system is working. So duct work, um, basically like the distribution system of your HVAC. And it's kind of like the veins in our body. And you know how you see all these commercials for all these pharmaceuticals about like, you know, cholesterol is bad, it builds up plaque in your heart, it makes it harder for your heart to work and to get that blood um, flowing through. It's kind of like that with your ductwork. You don't want any plaque in there. So you want to make it nice and easy for that air to flow through. So these two pictures here, this is ductwork where the insulation is showing through. Um, it's obviously like cut through by the straps that have been put there to support it. So these ductwork 
your system is working hard, and so that means you're having to pay more money to keep your room comfortable. Whereas over here, you can see that, okay, that, that looks like well-maintained ductwork, and it's a nice, soft angle for that term, so that way, again, it's not that 90-degree angle. And then over here, this ductwork is well-supported, and it's not cutting into um, the insulation around the ductwork. So just kind of go up and take a look in your attic, and again, with um, using this infrared thermometer, you'll be able to see if there's an issue with your ductwork by that temperature difference. And just a small note on that temperature difference, in the industry, there's like a good kind of healthy discussion and debate about what that real range should be. So if it's a little bit less or a little bit over, it's okay. Um, but definitely, you know, just take a look at it. So temperature and humidity. So has anyone been to like Arizona, South, Midwest? And it can be 100 degrees out there and it's, it's kind of comfortable. Whereas, well, compared to Florida or here. Cold. Or cold, exactly. Um, whereas if, if it was 100 degrees here in Florida, you know, you walk outside and you start dripping because it's so humid. So humidity actually plays a large part in the comfort of a room. And so in the backpack, we provide this hydro thermometer, which is basically just a fancy term for a device that tells you the temperature in the room. So this is reading about 72. And the humidity in the room, the moisture in the room. So this is reading about 54%. The uh, recommended range is between 40 and 60%. So that way, um, it's not too dry, that like, you know, it's causing your skin to dry out, and it's not too moist so that you're running into mold and building issues. And so you would place that in a room where you have some moisture issues, like bathroom or attic or ceiling, uh, or attic or crawl space rather, and leave it there for about 24 hours, and you'll be able to see the maximum and minimum uh, moisture content in the room, and that'll give you an indication of, wow, if it's 80%, we need to look into this because we might have like a leak or a crack or something, but definitely that's a little bit too moist. So base loads. Does anyone remember what that base load was that we talked about in the beginning? What it is? Okay, so base load is the minimum amount of energy required to heat your home. So aside from the temperature difference due to the weather, the extreme heat and the extreme cold, it's basically that constant energy that you're using. So it's like for appliances, like refrigerators, that's all in on, um, and other base loads like lights and hot water heating. So we're gonna talk about this. Um, and the interesting thing that I heard, not necessarily really recommending it, but um, JEA has this uh, radio show every Saturday, it's called Q&A with JEA, and a caller called in, and he's like, you know, I heard that basically your refrigerator has kind of like almost a five hour battery kind of if you will. And he's like, you know, you can unplug it at night as long as it's just for that five hours and then plug it back in. And he's talking about how he's saving energy. And so it was just kind of interesting, the things people do to save money on their energy. I would not recommend that. I like to make sure that my milk is not spoiled. Um, but so it's just kind of an interesting thing. People are getting creative. Um, but a full refrigerator is easier to do. Yes. It does not run as much. Exactly. Or a freezer. And yes. Yeah. So that way, because there's more things in there, helping keep it cool. So you want a cool freezer versus like, you know, your one can of like Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Um, so water heating. Water heating. Um, you know, it's right there um, underneath the heating and cooling. Um, it composes almost 20% of your electricity bill. And it really does depend on the number of people in your house. So if you have like a family of five, probably gonna have a little. Um, higher demand on water heating. But so some things you can do aside from just using less hot water. Um, one easy thing is, you know, wash your clothes in cold water. You know, you're not in there, um, so your clothes will actually get pretty clean um, just using cold water and you're saving money by not heating the water um, to wash your clothes. But also, um, most people have a storage tank for their hot water. And so basically it has to keep that water at that desired temperature so that way when you go to turn on the faucet, it's ready to go. So it maintains that in there. So make sure that the temperature setting on your storage tank is 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's kind of the sweet spot. Any lower, um, you run into some sanitary issues for your dishwasher. But that is the uh, setting where you still get that nice hot shower, um, but it's not scalding and it's not too low that 
come and run into those sanitary issues. Um, and then insulating your water lines. So it's about $2 to go buy this insulation at any hardware store, and it's really easy to be able to insulate these lines coming from your hot water heater. Um, and a lot of people uh, ask about, well, do I need to insulate the tank? You know, those big kind of like blankets almost that you're up around them. Um, newer hot water tanks have an internal blanket. So you won't see this big covering around it, but it's already in there. So if you have a newer hot water tank, um, check the manual and make sure that it's um, insulated on the interior. And unfortunately, there wasn't like a year where this was mandated. So I can't say 2,000, all of them moving forward um, have that internal blanket. But um, if you have a water tank that's about seven years old, we do have a lot of sediment in our water. So you might start to think about, well, what are some other options that I can pursue um, to have a little bit more affordable um, hot water and safe some energy. So a couple things, we have solar, um, a solar hot water here. And then there's also on-demand systems. So like tankless on-demand systems. So when you um, need that hot water, it heats it up right then rather than keeping it hot um, throughout the day. And then also heat pump water heaters. And these are actually really good here in Florida because we have those air source heat pumps for our HVAC system. It can actually retrofit um, a heat pump to basically heat your water. So it would take the heat from the air to heat your water. So it's kind of ingenious and um, pretty efficient. So this was the insulation I was talking about for the um, pipes. In like sixth grade, I made roller coasters um, with those marbles to go down. They're super cheap um, and it's super easy to do. This was a blanket we were talking about but also using a timer. So, you know, if you're out, if you work outside the home, you know, 95 are not there. So set the timer so that the hot water heater isn't on. That can save you some money. Um, just make sure you adjust it for the weekends. I have been victim to a full shower on Saturday morning. It's not a great wake up. Um, and then also solar and then tankless, and then this is the heat pump. <clears throat> so appliances and electronics. Um, has anyone heard of the phantom load? Yes. Do you know what that is? It's like your TV. It's waiting for your remote to turn it on, so it's always on, even though you don't think it's on. Exactly. So, like, if you turn it off, but it's still using energy because it is, like, waiting for that remote control um, to be able to click it on. So, even though things are turned off, it's still pulling energy. So, we call that phantom load or the vampire load because you don't think it's there, but it actually is. And by leaving things plugged in, so like these huge entertainment centers, that can really add up. So we want to put things into dollars and cents for everyone because, you know, if you don't track it and measure it, you don't really know how much you're using. So we have these cool kilowatt meters, and what they are is you plug in your device into it, and you'll set the rate, so it's 13 cents per kilowatt hour, and then leave it plugged in for like a day and see how much it costs you. It'll tell you the daily, weekly, and monthly um, charge. So I plugged in this projector when I first came in, and then see how much it's cost me. So it's been plugged in for about an hour, and so far it's cost me two cents. But for the day, it's gonna cost me 57 cents, and for the week, it'll cost me about four dollars. But for the month, 17 dollars and 10 cents. And this is just for the projector, that's not even for my computer. So, you know, it adds up. And you like don't realize it because you're like, well, I turned it off, I did my good deed, um, but it's actually it's still costing me money. And shoot, I'd rather spend seventeen dollars on my latte or like going on vacation than running a projector. So um, one quick easy thing that you can do: power strips. Plug your thing in a power strip, and then it's one off at the end of the night. And like so for entertainment centers, I have a friend who had an entertainment center, this wasn't hers, but something similar to that, where there's lots of TVs, you have the Xboxes, you have the stereo, and she has teenagers, so she's like, okay, turn it off at night, hit that, you know, power strip, um, master button, and turn it off. She saw a $20 energy saving monthly, so it really does add up, so turn it off. And, you know, use these kilowatt meters to find out, it'll really put it into dollars and cents. So lighting, lighting, we're in a very exciting time for lighting. Um, so not a lot has been done since Thomas Edison created the first incandescent light bulb. We've had some minor changes, but um, 
it's really pretty much been stagnant for the past 100 years. So if we were to put that in car terms, we would all basically be driving miles to force. And I don't know about you, but I like my AC, and I like having like a roof over my head when it rains. So, um, you know, we haven't come very far with light bulbs until recently. So, um, incandescence, everyone knows what that is, you know, that 60 watts, it's kind of like a baseline. So it's like, if you ever go abroad and they tell you the temperature in Celsius, you're like, oh my goodness, 10 degrees Celsius? Is that really cold or is that kind of normal? You kind of have to get a new kind of like baseline, like reference point. So that's kind of the stage that we're in right now. Um, so CFLs, compact fluorescent light bulbs, they're basically these fluorescent light bulbs that you see in uh, industrial commercial settings that they've been able to spiral around so that we can use it in the residential settings because they are more energy efficient. Um, it only takes 14 watts to run it versus the 60 watts for the incandescent. And they last longer as well. Um, and then now um, it's become more you know, cost effective to buy an LED, a light emitting diode, um, to use. And these last a long time. So, you know, it's still developing technology. They're making it better and better. And the price is coming down. And there are rebates. So JEA offers a lot of um, rebates for LEDs. And these last a long time, even more so than the CFL. So like one um, LED should last about 20 years. It might be 10 or 15, but it's still going to cost you less energy to operate it than your incandescent, which is taking 60 watts, whereas it's 12.5 watts for your LED. And you know, turn off your lights um, when you leave the room. So like if it's compact fluorescent, it's okay to leave it on for about 15 minutes, but if you're going to be gone longer than that, turn it off. Um, and so afterwards, please feel free to come and check this out. But these are basically just a light display to show you how you can get your LEDs in different shapes and forms and for spotlights. And it's really like multi versus one. Um, so I'm just going to plug this in, watch out, I'm going to blind you. Um, but so this is your typical, this is a 52 watt incandescent, and this is the CFL. And then these are all LEDs, and even a unique corn cob um, LED that you can put in like a light band just to kind of show the diversity of the type of light bulbs that you can get. So please feel free to stop by and kind of look at this a little bit more. Um, and so now that there's many changes, it's kind of um, re-educating our reference points. So lumens and Kelvins and what is this? And you know, people are going to the um, light bulb aisle at Home Depot or Lowe's and standing there for 30 minutes trying to figure out, I want whatever is equivalent to a 60 watt incandescent light bulb. I want that kind of warm lighting, but how do I get that? Um, so there is an app um, out there that can help you with that. And there's cards on that um, welcome table with the app on it. And it's free, it's called Light Bulb Finder. And it'll help ask you about like the type of device that you're looking for the light bulb. So is it like an overhead light or is it a lamp? And then it'll ask you about the base and all those kind of questions to help basically make you a uh, shopping list. So that way when you go to the store and you're trying to get the light bulb, you already know, okay, so this is the kind that I want. This is the brightness and all that stuff. So it'll help kind of walk you through those factors. Okay, and incentives, we're all about saving money. So as you're beginning to think about, like, well, what can I do in my home? You go home and do the energy audit. Um, check out JEA, Shop Smart. They have a lot of incentives, rebates for helping with um, insulation, installation, and also for LEDs. And then also um, desireusa.org is a great database. Um, it'll list all the applicable rebates, federal, state, and local um, that you can look into to help you with your energy improvement. Projects. So we're going to move on to water. Um, an interesting fact about water, um, we live in Florida, we live on the peninsula, we're essentially surrounded by water, and we can go out to the beach in like 10 minutes. But of all the water on the earth, less than 1% of it is fresh water that we can use. And when I say we use, I mean for con con commercial, industrial, and for residential. So for everybody. So of that, um, so the way that it breaks down is basically of all the water, 2.5% um, of it is fresh water. And then of that 2.5%, 68% of that is basically frozen. So your glaciers and your ice caps. 
And so then that leaves, like basically about 35%, about 2.5% of all fresh water that's available. So that means that of all the water, it's less than 1% that we can use for watering our lawns, for brushing our teeth, for cooking, for making tea. And um, to bring this home locally here, um, the St. John's River Water Management District, which basically kind of oversees our aquifers for um, like Northeast Florida, they are basically putting out a 20 year kind of progress report and plan. And they're basically finding that by 2035, our aquifer won't be able to meet our energy demands by like a couple million gallons per day, like 230. This is by 2035, this is in 20 years. Um, so definitely please like, you know, check it out. Um, St. John's River Water Management, if you guys are interested, I can send you a link to the report to find out, if you want to see it for yourself. Is a you know in the finalizing the report, but that's kind of scary. That's 20 years. That's in my lifetime, folks. Like you know, this is not like way into the future. Like we might you know live on Mars. This is like in my lifetime. So let's talk about what we can do to kind of conserve water. Um, so the first step of the water audit is a lot like the energy audit first step. You're gonna find out about your water usage and put it on here. We also have that um, interactive PDF on jea.com forward slash backpack, so it'll help you do the math. Um, a cool thing that's already inherent into the um, billing rate is that it's a tiered rate. So it pays to use less water. Um, water's really cheap too. So for 1,000 to 6,000 gallons of water, it's 93 cents per thousand gallons. So basically it's like $6 to use 6,000 gallons. Um, but as your consumption goes up, that price per thousand gallons increases as well. Um, so that the max would be, if you're using over 20,000 gallons, $5.60 per thousand gallons. But at that point, you're using a lot of water, so you want to check to see what's going on. Did you leave the hose on? Do you have a huge water leak? Definitely something to check out about. Um, so you want to find and fix those leaks. So just as we talked about infiltration with air in the building envelope, you also want to check for your water. So, um, what you can do is basically you want to turn off all your like water fixtures, so don't flush the toilet, turn off your ice machine, and go outside and check your water meter. Um, if this red area here, that dial is spinning around crazy, go back in, check that you turned off everything, that no one had to go to the bathroom and flush the toilet, um, and then come back outside and see if that dial is moving. If it's moving, you have a little If it's not moving, Leave it there for about 10 minutes, go inside, get a nice cup of iced tea, and then come back out and make sure that it hasn't moved. If it hasn't moved, you're in the clear, no water risk. But if it has moved, okay, you need to identify where that leak is. Um, and the two biggest culprits in the house are basically just like faucet leaks, so you know your kitchen sink kind of leaking, or also then toilet flappers. So the way to find out if your toilet flapper is leaking is that, you know, that nice big glass of iced tea that you had and you're kind of relaxing, then go to your toilet and put it in the back tank of your toilet. And then leave it there, don't flush it, and let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then come back and see if that kind of like brown of the tea has seeped into the toilet bowl. If it has, that means you <coughs> have a toilet bowl with flapper. Flappers are about maybe even $5 at a hardware store, and there's lots of YouTube videos to help you walk through fixing that. And I even had a gentleman a couple weeks ago say, yeah, I have my mother-in-law with that. And I'm sure his mother-in-law was at least 60, if not older, so like anyone can do it. But definitely it'll be worthwhile so that way, you know, your energy, your water consumption is not increasing. So then it goes into, okay, well I don't have any leaks. What about the efficiency of your fixtures? So for this, I do have two magical numbers. I have 1992 and 1994. In 1992, legislation was passed that basically fixtures had to become more efficient. So your kitchen faucet, your shower heads need to become more water efficient. And it had to be implemented by 1994. So if you are in the market for looking for new fixtures, then you want to make sure it is made post-1994. And so then also to look around in your own home, you know, how, how new are my fixtures, how old are they, um, where are they in regards to 1994. Um, and so if you're you know, going around a home that's 20 years old um, and you know, maybe it's not as efficient, um, if you're looking for new fixtures and shower heads, you also want to look for the water scent symbol. Um, those are 20% more efficient 
than the standard. And so I'm all about having good pressure in my shower. Like, I don't know how long I'm going to You know, I feel like I have to stand in there even longer. Um, but by getting water sense ones, they have aerators in there that help maintain that pressure. It's just a little bit less water. I saw you shaking your head. Yeah, because my house is built in uh, 1992. Oh, well, so it might be like changes. No. no. Well, <laughs> well, the way that you can test first, so you don't have to go out, you know, buy something if it's not broken. Um, we do include in the backpack these flow meters. So basically, you would. Put this under your faucet, sink or under your shower head at the volume at which you basically let it flow. So if you're washing your hands, put it at that same kind of flow rate. And you leave it in there for five seconds. And then it'll be able to tell you, okay, well, oh, this is water sense. This is a good um, gallons per minute rate. Or, no, this is like four gallons per minute for a faucet. And that's going to cost you like $11 per year extra. So it's a great way to, again, measure and find out how it is. And putting aerators in, aerators are like $2 at the hardware store. So it's just the shower head? Well, the I shower head and the faucet. I have, oh, okay. It's so yeah. changed out the shower head. But so it's your faucet, too. Yeah. But so this way it'll help you find out how efficient they are. Um, so shower time. Another thing that we include.